could still stay watching yeah. almost all the way. Well, just yeah, ask her, I don't know, she's going to do a general introduction first, I think. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Falmouth Art Center's third virtual art reception. I'm Laura Reckford, Executive Director of the Falmouth Art Center. I love this audience we have today because we have a number of people who are in the current abstract juried show here at the Art Center, and I'm sure they will enjoy hearing from the juror, who's one of our guests today, about abstract art. We have a terrific program this afternoon. Uh, there are several people signed up who cannot attend. And so we are recording the session and we'll send it to those who couldn't make it. Before we start, some Zoom tips for everyone. I know most of you are very familiar with Zoom, but for those who aren't, please mute your, uh, yourself or we will mute you. And that's so we don't hear your dog barking and your neighbor blowing the leaves around and your spouse asking about dinner, et cetera. Um, so uh, please, please do mute yourself during the presentations. You can ask questions though at any time through the chat key, which is in the center, um, the lower center of your screen. Um, you can use the uh, speaker view to be able to see the speakers best. And you'll, it, you're able to toggle between the speaker view and the gallery view by simply uh, clicking on the toggle, which is either, depending on your device, is either in the upper right-hand corner or the upper left-hand corner, the toggle between speaker and gallery. Gallery view, we call the Brady Bunch view. It has everyone in an equal size box and speaker view has the speaker in a larger box. And uh, when people are, when the artists are speaking and showing off their studio, you might enjoy having them in the larger box. So you'll be on speaker view. And if while they are speaking, someone's not on mute and takes away the screen, which is what happens when someone makes a sound, if they're not on mute, you can just double click the person speaking, the artist speaking so that they'll stay um, in the large screen during the speaker view. And um, so those are just some brief things to know about your Zoom screens. Uh, the, uh, later in the program today, we will share the screen and you'll see the speaker in a small box and a PowerPoint in the large box. And you can control whether you see additional small boxes by clicking above the box on the horizontal line for um, if you want to just see the PowerPoint or you can show one or more boxes. That will become more clear when we get to the PowerPoint. And so a few quick announcements about the Falmouth Art Center. Our mask exhibit and fundraiser is underway. We have amazing creative masks on exhibit at the Art Center and also on our website. The way it works is you vote for your favorite mask and for a small $10 donation to the Art Center, you have a chance to win the mask and you can vote as many times as you want. We hope you'll visit or see it on our website at falmouthart.org. Our abstract jury show is up for another 10 days or so and we have that on our website at falmouthart.org or here in person. Wendy Vogel, a local artist from East Falmouth, just put up her show here in our Siegel Gallery. So we have three shows on view now. And we will be having our holiday market this year starting on November 20th in person for five weeks. We'll have some things online as well and some things outside as well. And if you wanna be a vendor at our holiday market, you simply bring in your artworks, your crafts, your paintings, um, in the next three days, we're accepting things for our holiday market. You do need to be a member and we have the paperwork we can send you if you want to participate. As a reminder, we're open seven days a week and we are free with three galleries here. And now to the main event. Here is what is on the agenda today. We'll start with hearing from Richard Neal. He was the juror for our abstract juried show this year, and he'll uh, show us his work and also tour us around his studio. Then we'll go to Mary Moquin, an artist who had her work here as part of a show in the summer. Her studio is next to Richard's studio, so we'll uh, take advantage of that and see her studio and what she's working on now. And then we'll go to Corinne Adams, a ceramics artist and art educator whose work is in 
the current juried abstract show and she'll show a PowerPoint about her work and show off her studio. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions during the presentations, use the chat button rather than interrupting. And I will uh, ask your question as serving as moderator. And then after each presentation, we'll also have a chance for Q&A. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Richard Neal. Some of you may know Richard Neal's work as he is very involved in the art scene here on Cape Cod. He is a painter and sculptor who was born in Washington, DC, grew up in Maryland, and now works at Chalkboard Studios in Barnstable Village. He earned a Bachelor of Art, a Fine Arts degree from the UMass at Dartmouth, and also a Master's of Fine Arts from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. His work has been exhibited in many group and one person shows and is included in numerous private collections. He's represented here on the Cape by Miller White Fine Arts in Dennis. His work is currently on a three city tour of Cuba. He was featured recently at the Boston International Fine Arts Show and will have a one person show at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum in 2023. He is the inaugural recipient in 2015 of the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod Fellowship. A local arts writer wrote of him, Neil is a master at creating distressed surfaces full of invention and the unexpected touch and confrontational in their manufacture and effect. Hello, Richard. Hi, how are you, Laura? Good, thanks for so, being here with us. I'm glad to be here. I'm outside with Mary Moke. I'm just gonna keep it on the building for a minute. This is Chalkboard Studios where we work, where both of us work. We're just gonna walk you right in the door, give you a little quick idea of what it's like coming into the work. I work on the second floor. Here's the lobby. I'm, I'm, I work up in the second floor. We, we have a nice big wide staircase to bring things up and down. On the walls. Got this little spot up top where we can, lots of books to look through and place to sit. Think about things once in a while and my studio is over here and it man it's a mess it's a pretty pretty big mess going on in here yeah. Laura told me not to clean up too much so yeah I'll give you a sense of the chaos that goes on here so I'm going to hand this off to, to Mary yeah so we can talk to so you asked me about talking about the the abstract show a bit I'm just going to refer to my notes here had a lot of great entries for that show. I'll tell you, it was really tough picking out things and I hope I didn't make too many enemies by the two choices I made, but um, had some really wonderful work. I think I noticed in my notes that there, were, uh, there was an exceptional amount of photography that I thought really fit well to the theme of the abstraction. And uh, I chose it fairly small. I were, there were over 120 works and I chose out only about 40, but um, they're, they're really strong works, I think, and I think it's a, a strong show. If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you get a chance to go. Uh, Laura also mentioned that she would talk, that I should talk about the work that I have in the show. And, and Richard, I'm gonna interrupt for one minute because I wonder if you could just talk about what it's like to jury an abstract show, what things you're looking for. Yeah, that's tricky because you know if you're if you're if you're during a realistic show, I mean things are things are fairly fairly uh, clearer. It's it's more subjective, I think, when you're during an abstract show. But you still, I still go back to some very basic things that I learned about art and have have developed as an artist, and just finding works that are have strong compositions that, or strong use of materials and and. Uh, it's, it's pretty subjective, I realize. Uh, I, someone else probably would have chosen out a completely different show, but um, 
that's the show I, I chose out. Um, do you have a picture up there of the work that I put in? I do, so I can share the screen and show that and I'll get that ready for you right now. You asked me to talk about it, so I guess I will. Uh, it's, uh, it's a piece that, like a lot of the ones that I work on, it really changes a lot as I go along. Sometimes I go from point A to point B, and other times it's really more of a uh, discovery. And uh, this one here went through lots of changes. It probably turned around several times. It looked a lot different in other incarnations. I can't even quite remember what it was like before, but um, I put some materials on. I took some materials off. As a sculptor, I think I tend to work that way. It's, it's additive and subtractive. It's not just a matter of adding things on. It's sometimes a matter of pulling them back off again or sanding it down or just almost starting over sometimes. Um, this one sort of pleased me at the point where it had the three primaries. I just kind of realized at some point, oh, the three primaries are there in black and white and gray. I got those gray areas by using uh, screens. I noticed that the screen, like a metal screen, like you would find an insect screen, that sort of um, gave a, a half tone to certain areas. I found that was kind of an interesting way to work with the grays. Um, the title was just sort of came out of the blue. I think of it as something that's a little bit maybe potential, has potential for danger perhaps or something. Or maybe, maybe the title just lends it that, but it seems like something you could wire up and make it go or make something happen. So that's pretty much it on that one. If anybody has questions, uh, I can take them on later. Um, okay, and we're back. Well, when I saw that piece, when, when you walked in the door with it, I thought to myself, oh, I love it. It's, it's a plate of oysters. And <laughs> then I realized <laughs> it wasn't, but it reminds me of oysters. And this time of year, that's a very nice thing to be reminded of. Yeah, we're in our month, aren't we? Can yeah. I just start eating them? This one here is kind of a um, um, COVID piece, I think. I didn't even quite realize it, but I started making this in maybe March and I was in here a lot by myself and um, of course that's not all that unusual to be in here by yourself so maybe in some ways coronavirus COVID times are not so different for some artists who work alone but I did was feeling extra kind of lonely and I realized it's sort of this piece sort of um, uh, sort of embodied that kind of loneliness that I was feeling. Um, this one over here got pretty much brighter over the last, it changed a lot once again, but I got these greens and blues going and it really lightened up a lot. It's a strange one that's kind of a, kind of a hallucinogenic almost. I don't quite know what's going on there, but that's the nature of things sometimes. This is a, this is a large one I've been working on for the last few months. And in fact, I might've started this, uh, even last year or even longer ago, I had a completely different painting going here and I just um, got sick of it and I cut it apart and put it back together. And uh, that's a lot of times the way the working process is for me is even though it's kind of a two dimensional piece, it's got a lot of 3D things going on and it's a matter of stitching and ripping and pulling it apart and gluing things back together. And it's, um, Sculptural for me. I'm, I'm a sculptor, basically, at heart. Can you focus on, on these for Oh, sure. This was, I don't know if any of you were able to see the show at um, Highfield Hall. I had some book pieces at a show in Highfield Hall. One day I came in and uh, I don't know what the idea was, but I simply decided I wanted to put a cord right through the book. So I got a drill the right size and I drilled a hole and I ran, ran the wire up through the book and down. And at the time I did, I was like, ah, there you go, done. But then I realized maybe it's really just um, the ideas that could be used in a bigger piece or something. So I had rope going through and I had some of them hanging 
from the trees out there. Um, I think of it as kind of a statement about history, about our history in this country and how it's kind of a bad history. And these ones here, I put a lot of white paint on. I really kind of whitewashed the whole lot of them and had them in a room upstairs at Highfield Hall. Oh, a much bigger pile of, of white books. I just realized at some point that a lot of the things that I learned in school weren't, weren't exactly true. Um, and uh, it's, it's on all of us really to find out about history and find out what truth really is and how you break that down is very important to, to being a person and being a citizen right now, I think. So I, uh, maybe we can just do a little more of a standing room, but yeah. Pretty much. Anything you want to show them special? Oh, well, oh we'll my. A little bit. You're over there now. Oh, okay. I can't seem to get it to switch to active speakers. Any questions for Richard? Questions for Richard as he uh, wraps up the studio tour here. Lots of interesting things he's working on, that's for sure. This is my view out the back. I can see uh, Barnesville Harbor from here especially in the winter time. Um, and sometimes my studio is not this big of a mess. Trust me, once in a while, once in a while I do clean it up, but right now it's, uh, it's a little crazy. Looks good. Yeah. We do have a question for you, Richard. Um, sure. And the, the question is, how do you start a painting? How do I start a painting? Uh, sometimes I, I have a specific idea. I've done portraits before where I'll have a specific idea of a person I want to paint the picture of and I use a source uh, and go about it very directly. Other times uh, I think like maybe with this one here, I, I um, had some sense of a composition that I wanted, but then I, I take... Uh, liberties as I go, I the, the painting informs me. I think abstraction tends to be like more you like it. So you can, I did. Like that, so you can stand here and just show it to us oh, like this. Yeah, well, it's easier. <laughs> That's easier for you. Yeah, but I so was, you don't have to yeah. look it over your back shoulder. All right. Anyway. Um, and, well, we have yeah. another question here. Richard, sure. what is your favorite medium? Hmm. Well, as far as painting goes, I, I prefer to use oils. Um, I, Mary does a great job with acrylic. She's gonna show you some work in acrylic in a couple minutes, but personally, I, I um, tend to like oils just mainly for their color, for the surface of them. I can also work them a lot longer. I can, I can work in oils. Uh, some people are aggravated by that. They don't like the fact that it takes so long to dry, but personally, I, I like that. You know, you can be scraping along and all of a sudden you pull through and there's a whole patch of uh, bright orange or something underneath that you didn't know was there and it livens up your painting again. Um, but as you can see from the books and things, I, I like to work with a lot of different uh, materials, uh, not just painting. And someone else asks, do you start with materials or an idea or both? Good one, good question. Um, I guess it's both really, yeah, it's both. Um, I, I on, on this one over my shoulder here, I think I started um, with an idea of some kind of a, um, landscape with an, an object or a mountain or something there, but it, it can change. Um, I Sometimes the materials do inform me and I just go with the materials, but I usually have an, I usually have an idea in mind when I start, but it, I'm open to change. It usually, usually does change somewhere along the line. Another question, is your studio open for us to visit? It's unfortunate that um, we haven't been able to have an open studio here in uh, more than a year. And uh, 
we don't have it open all the time. People have jobs, they have other jobs and uh, it's uh, not something that we're allowed to really have it open to the public. So we have open studios, tried to have them a couple times a year, but obviously we haven't been able to recently. If you'd like to make an appointment, you can find the contact information, give us a call. Someone can, can meet you here. We'll put the contact info um, up on our website if people can, uh, maybe they can email you. Is that a good way to schedule an appointment? Yeah, email is great, sure. Yeah, so I'll put that up to people on this uh, call and I'll email that to, to the group. Another question, um, the small pieces are of interest. Do they inform your larger pieces? And also sort of a similar question, do the small pieces relate to the larger pieces? Yeah, that's a good question. Here's a couple of smaller ones here. Um, I, I usually tend to, um, to work both large and small um something like this i really don't know i really don't know it's probably hard to tell what this is but it's really a piece of glass piece of glass that got broken right in the middle so i glued it all down to a board will it become a piece is it a piece i don't know it's it's not, i'm not sure sometimes these things are are kind of like testers for me here's another example over here Maybe if I can find it, <laughs> there it is. I mean, it's really just, you know, matchsticks glued onto, onto a piece of paper and paint them up. It just sort of gives me ideas for, for materials. I don't, I know that's not really a piece. It's more like a tester. Um, this one here is made out of jigsaw puzzle parts that I pulled apart and glued, glued back together. Sometimes I feel like the small ones are more finished than others. And sometimes, yeah, they do, they do inform the larger pieces. Um, maybe that's something that's a little clearer when you look at both small and large, I'm not sure. Um, let me give you an example here. Here's a collage. It's made mainly black paper. Um, pieces of paper glued uh, glued on. I, I like that composition. So I pretty much took a lot of the elements of that and I used it on this painting up here, which is a fairly large painting. Mm -hmm. But I found a lot of that composition that I liked over here. So yeah, the small ones, the small ones do help me with the large ones. Another question is, do your initial ideas change with your emotions? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, I think that in general, uh, I think in general that the emotions are there and they come out in the work. It doesn't necessarily mean that I come in up angry about something and I slash away at my pictures and express my emotions directly that way. I don't think that's quite how it works for me. I'm not sure about other artists, but I think it's still filtered through my, my um, process of making pictures through the things that I, my, my aesthetics basically. Um, just because I um, ripped some books apart and um, painted them all black. I don't think it's because I'm an angry person. It just was the, the type of thing that I wanted to visually. It's a thing that I wanted visually. Does that answer your question? I think, I mm. think it does. Um, I see another question coming here. I am new to abstracts, struggle with ideas, uh, fear uh, entering um, to my fitting of uh, my hitting the canvas any ideas on how to get over this i am trying to loosen up with my work yeah it's it's really just get in there and do it you know and don't be afraid of things just don't be afraid and just do them you know don't second guess yourself too much if it doesn't come out well what's the big deal what's the problem it's all about just doing it making work i don't know that probably sounds too simple but 
get in there and do it. Don't make excuses, just get going. Great advice for us in all aspects of life. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other questions for Richard? Quest we, we can get back um, to questions for him later in the program if something uh, someone thinks of something. But thank you so much, Richard. That was excellent. I know we learned a lot from seeing your, your space and our- My um, pleasure. Attendees at this and these virtual art receptions have particularly requested messy artist studios. So thank you so much for, well, for showing us yours. We appreciated it. And glad I could comply with that request. <laughs> thank yeah. you. And now we go to Mary Moquin, who has been, she was serving as a camera person for Richard for part of that. Mary has a BFA in printmaking and an MFA in painting from UMass Dartmouth. Her studio is next door to Richard's at the Old Schoolhouse Galleries in Barnstable Village. She has had many, many solo shows and shows with other artists on Cape Cod for the past 20 years. I mentioned she was here at the Falmouth Art Center this past summer with several artists, the Cove Gallery in Wellfleet, the Cahoon Museum um, in Katuit, among many others. In her artist statement on her website, she writes, that there are many doors of transition and transformation that each of us experience in the course of a lifetime, some that are of our own choosing and some that unexpectedly slam behind us. It is at those times that our perception shifts, our priorities change, beliefs are challenged. For several years, she has focused on two motifs that serve as her metaphors to explore these questions. One example from nature, the tree, and another man-made, the house. Both of these endure the hostility of the ever-changing environment. Both serve as shelter and both are equipped with different methods of coping and both ultimately decay. They bear witness to time's constant wearing away on any notion of permanence while she watches. And here is Mary to show us recent work and her studio. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hello. So, I, I, I guess, you know, I probably don't need, I, I mean, I love to have you, Richard, but I probably don't even need you because I can do what you did, right? Sure. I'll do what he did, right? I'll just pass you around and I'll just walk you around and show you the things I've been working on. Although, you know, Richard's always fun to get. So right now I'm like, because it's winter time, it's my time to just um, dive in and have a grand old time and uh, explore and see what comes out. And um, so I have a nice messy studio too, lots of stuff in process. I've been working away today. I'm doing this um, kind of a somewhat abstract, um, series right now that I don't exactly know where I'm going with, but I'm having a lot of fun. Richard loves it. It's really big. You can see it next to my other. So it's a nice uh, juxtaposition that he had, Richie was just giving me a nice chat today saying, whoa, you know, I can be super realistic or I can be um, kind of out there and more at um, nah, but you know, these are some of my, and I think some of the kind of tree work, um, you know, comes across in some of the mark making that even comes into my figures, my figure work. So most people, I've been doing a lot of the houses. Oh yeah, Rich is holding another one for me. Oh yeah, it's yeah. kind of dark, he likes that one. It's kind of backlit right now. Yeah, there you go, turn it sideways. Oh yeah, he's now my Vanna White, right? <laughs> So this is a whole series that I was doing. I've just taken on the whole idea of, um, I actually one morning stumbled upon this photograph up here, which is a very, you know, re representational scene in my front yard. It had rained, so the, the branches were really black and the beach plums were these white puffy things. And, there were all these scratchy grasses and all these pokey things. And I just, and the splash of pink and the dust. So I was just trying to hold on to those ideas. And I also, also myself, I work on, you know, weird studies, um, a series of, I have a whole bunch of things I was just doing, kind of throwing paint around, just trying to get the feel of um, those kind of things, that juxtaposition of the 
pokey scratchy thing and and anything goes i've been doing a lot of like somewhat printmaking methods where i just squirt the paint onto these pieces of paper and then i might take the this painted squirted painting and just like put it up on the thing and rub it and move it around see what happens so some of those marks are happening from and you know and it's you know it's the same similar i think to what richard does just the idea of that push and pull you just go at it and slap a lot of stuff and then you step back and you look at it for a while and you think about it and you have some sort of an idea but then it has to talk to you and decide what it wants to be but i do go back and forth between very much more representational work is the really portrait i did of my mother all in black and white and her lovely dog and um you know more most of my houses right now although i do have a selection of houses is my little model that i built of my house so that i could play god and turn it around into all different kinds of light and try to decide because it's white i can kind of superimpose any kind of color um, scheme that I want to. So, and there's like, I also do encaustic work. There's all my little, a bunch of the little encaustic trees. So same sort of idea. Some of them are finished pieces. Some of them are just ideas for pieces. Like um, Richard was referring to, to keep some things around and open to remind you of a certain, this one was a real fun outdoor plein air painting I did that was actually just done with my fingers because I just wanted to get back and touch and feel the paint and move things around. And um, so this is my time of kind of renewal. Here's my, my wonderful little quarantine picture. Hmm. Makes you feel good, huh? <laughs> but that's that whole piece that, piece that I had in the family show that people remember. But again, it had some of that same type of methodology going on in the background that I have going on in can see kind of the connection. So I think uh, I think that's it. Ooh. Thank you, Mary. And questions for Mary, putting it out to the, the group here. We have a lot of artists on this call and obviously people really interested in art and abstract art in particular. Questions just for Mary. I love having you here though. This, now, that's a portrait right there. Look at that. I got a screenshot that. I love the plaid with the stripes. Awesome. Questions for Mary. Yeah, they're probably all questioned out. I've answered them all. Mary, I know a lot of people. Um, I certainly I was first familiar with your work from the houses, which um, you certainly see. Uh, at galleries around the Cape, I think maybe the Cove Gallery, and um, obviously a, a popular um, popular uh, subject matter for you. Is what? Is the the houses? Yeah, the houses are, be well, you know, I mainly, it's mainly because, well, I don't want to say I'm lazy, but I spend all summer at Sandy Neck and I live in a cottage out there and I really find it a very peaceful contemplative space. And I tend to just keep reinventing the shapes and the spaces there because I find them very meditative and very soothing. So I've actually been doing a lot of houses through this whole um, COVID period and actually they're all on their way. I'm gonna be having a virtual exhibit at the Cove Gallery that's going to happen soon, like probably in the next couple of weeks. So I am uh, delivering work to them yesterday. That's why tomorrow, that's why I don't have anything with me much here. Um, but it's that whole idea of stillness and, and sacred space and finding a space and staying centered. And um, this piece right here actually was just um, be chosen as the cover of a poetry book that's coming up out uh, the Bass River uh, Poets through the Cultural Center. So this is gonna be um, the cover of that, which I was very excited to have that happen. But that, because it's just that idea of stillness, peace, quiet, maybe a little bit about being enlightened if you're lucky. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Um, we're getting some questions in now. Um, someone saying that they're disappointed that you're not teaching in the spring. Well, we don't know yet about the spring. I may be teaching by spring. It's all going to depend on what's going on with this virus. Yeah. Um, well, we right certainly always love to have you at the Falmouth Art Center teaching. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, that's that's mainly what's going on right now. I am doing some online type of teaching. Um, a little bit of, uh, you know, I have a Facebook group that a virtual, you know, group where people are sending me work and I'm giving them input, encouraging them and um, working that way. Um, nice. I do. I, I'm also available to have like one on one critiques and input here. Um, I'm happy to um, do something like that. Uh, I just wasn't feeling comfortable. I have a 95 year old mother living at home with me. Um, so I wasn't feeling comfortable being out and about with um, no matter how careful we're all trying to be. So yeah. it just seemed to be the prudent thing to do right now until, until the world changes a little. Absolutely. A um, couple more questions for you. Who made the model for you? I think she must mean the house model. Love oh, yeah. I, I actually did that way. myself. I actually built that. I was out. That is actually the house that's next to the lighthouse. And um, I had to get the house from I had all different short shots from different angles. I had to figure out how it all came together. And it's pretty much to scale, but it's made out of foam core. And I tell you, it was a heck of a lot of fun. And if I flipped it around, which I can't easily do, it is the other side of the house, which has, so all of these houses here, you know, show you different angles of the house from a different perspective, complete with the whole porch in the front, um, but it's a little fragile too, so. Another just, question uh, for you, Mary, can you tell us about your surfaces you paint on? Oh, about anything that'll accept paint. Um, some of them are canvas. Sometimes I work on canvas. You know, these, this one that I'm working now on the wall is just a piece of cam raw canvas tacked to the wall. This one is, is currently acrylic. I, I, um, I mix clear gesso in with my acrylic paint while I'm working so that at any point, if I want to switch and turn this into an oil painting, which may happen, because I agree, there are a lot of things. I am a primarily, I use oil paints primarily, but I'm having a lot of fun with these um, acrylic. Look at that, huh? Is that not yummy? There's just something very freeing about being able to just take these big bottles of paint and just like, just squirt them out with abandon and freedom and swing a brush around that at least when I'm starting a painting, it's a lot easier for me because it's, you know, squirting out a whole tube of paint is a little more painful of oil paint because it's more money. <laughs> but um, these are just luscious and I'm having a grand old time just working with them and printing with them. And there's certain techniques that I can get with the acrylic that I can't achieve as easily with the oil. So I think, you know, it's fun to work back and forth. Did Here's another, another, another question question for you. You have a great sense of color. Do you think of color first and then the subject? Um, yeah. I think oftentimes I do start with a color scheme like or a color thought, particularly like with, with the houses. I mean, I spent a lot of time. They still are very, very traditional color theory. Like this is a red and green palette that I just mixed all the colors in between from mixtures of the reds and greens. Um, yeah, easy as that, right? So oftentimes I'll start with one intense bright note for the sky, you know, I'll have like an idea. Okay, this one's gonna be all about purples and yellows and pinks and, and where can I go with that? And so I give myself a limitation, I guess, oftentimes before I start a painting. So I do start with the idea often of color, of this one is going to be, uh, these, are, these, are, these are actually photocopies, printouts of previous small paintings that I've kept around as ideas. So it's like, you know, I've been painting a lot of pink lately. I think it's my response to needing more pink in my life because things have been so miserable in the world. So a lot of pink going on right now. I, most of my pink is gone right now, but, uh, but it's, it's, yes, I definitely start with color, but I have an idea. I mean, I have an idea of what, I'm going to, I have an idea of what the subject matter is probably going to be. Like I knew what my subject matter was going to be, but then, then I choose a color palette. Great. Thank you for that. And this is another uh, plug for you teaching uh, someone saying that Zoom classes are great. Do those. And of course, we at the Falmouth Art Center certainly agree with that. We love our Zoom classes that are going. So 
they do work yeah, well. I played, I played a little with Zoom, but I, I'm enjoying the Facebook group because it's, it doesn't require everybody to come together at a specific time. So that's been working nice. And I can have live elements to it, but not have the whole thing reliant on a, on a, on a live window. Yeah. Artists are finding ways to get together during this time. So that's really the positive. Um, other questions for Mary? It's been really fun seeing your studio and all these beautiful paintings on the wall. And if you, if people think of questions for Mary as the program proceeds, just go ahead and, and put it in the chat and we can get back to those after. So at this time, I'll say a big thank you to Mary Moquin. And uh, Mary, I'm sure the same thing holds for you as to Richard in terms of if people want to visit your studio or be in touch that maybe they can shoot you an email to make an appointment, something like that. Sure, yeah, definitely. And like I say, I do still have one-on-ones. I'm happy to you know, have people come for an hour of a, a direct one-on-one -on -one and talk about their work and try to give them some input or whatever their questions or you know, direction that they have that they wanna ask about, whether it's materials, whether it's about you know, content, whatever. So thank you so much, Mary. And now we'll go on to our third artist at today's program, Corinne Adams. Corinne is a ceramics artist and art educator. She is the ceramics teacher at Falmouth High School. And she lives in the town of Bourne. She has a very interesting international background that she'll tell you about. She also attended UMass Dartmouth. So this whole program is sort of an advertisement for UMass Dartmouth's art department. She received a bachelor's of fine arts and a master's in art education at UMass Dartmouth. And uh, Corinne is gonna be sharing her screen. So this is when um, you'll be able to um, uh, alter your screens. It will come up with the big screen of her PowerPoint and you will see her in a smaller box and you can adjust that uh, as you will move around the box as you like. And so welcome Corinne. Whoops, Corinne, you're on mute. Yep. Okay, I got there it. There you go. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll share my screen and then I'll go back to this one uh, when we're done. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm Corinne Adams. Hello. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about my work and uh, my background. Uh, this is me teaching at school. As Laura said, I teach at Falmouth High School. I teach ceramics. Uh, I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Uh, that's why I still have an accent. But I've been in the United States for probably close to 25 years on Cape Cod. Uh, in Holland, uh, in um, I went to a graphic design school in Rotterdam, so I have a degree in graphic design. That's how I started. As I, uh, I ran the art department uh, in Aruba uh, for the newspapers there for several years, and then ended up in the United States. Uh, and then I continued my education. Uh, I got a bachelor's of fine arts from UMass Dartmouth uh, and a master's in art education. And I'm lucky to have two studios. One of them is at my work at Falmouth High School, where I teach ceramics. Um, this is what the classroom looks like now because of COVID. Normally, we have large tables and 10 pottery wheels. And unfortunately, now we have small little desks. Um, I think I have 12 desks in there, but the maximum amount of kids I have is about eight or nine. And then the other students are, you know, attending class remotely. I uh, actually have a picture of that as well. So here would be my my desk with, uh, so I will be teaching, uh, like in this case, it, it will be a, a coiled pot and you can see little camera in, uh, in front of the coiled pot. So that's how I can demo. I also make a lot of tutorial videos so the students can go back into it. Uh, because just because I demo it and now it's their turn doesn't mean they remember what they just looked at. So they can always go back into the videos and then uh, figure out what their next step is. And see on the left is my computer. So while I teach uh, students in class, 
uh, I at the same time I teach the other uh, students uh, remotely uh, via Zoom. Uh, so that's where the uh, where the computer is there. Uh, at the high school, we have a couple kilns, electric kilns that we can use as well. Uh, we have a slap roller. Thank God now that we have those tiny little desks to roll our clay. You know, it's not very easy to roll your clay on a tiny little desk. You need more space. So uh, if the, the students are in class that week, we use the slap roller if we're hand building with slaps. Uh, and we got, we're down to two wheels. We have 10, but they're all in storage because also we cannot uh, recycle clay especially when you're on the pottery wheel, there's a lot of clay to be recycled. Um, so, and, and I needed the space to have the desks in there, the small desks. So my home studio, uh, I am in the home studio and I'll show you that later on, but I took a couple pictures so you have a better idea. Uh, so I have a wheel, I have a kiln, uh, it's in my basement. Um, and, um, we got lots of storage shelves for glazes and equipment and protective gear and books for you know glaze um, ingredients. Uh, this is the other view of my studio. <clears throat> I have a grid hanging from the walls for my hanging pieces um, because you know that's the problem with ceramics. It's all very bulky. You need a lot of space to store it as well. And as you can see under the table there, that's why I do the hand building. Um, I store all my clay and I'm going to show you a little bit of the artwork as well. Uh, the majority of my work is fired in an electric kiln uh, and I tend to coil a lot of my pieces. Uh, I'm really not that strong to make large pieces on the wheel. I might start on the pottery wheel, but then continue coiling it. And my studio assistant is there supervising me in that picture. Um, so, so a lot of my work has a lot of movement in it, a lot of swirls and texture, uh, which is not necessarily abstract. And we'll talk about my piece in a minute that is in the abstract show that started out as a large coiled pot. Um, again, movement, this is a coiled pot then with coils added and a lot of carving. Um, here's another one. So lots of movement, lots of swirls. And this is the piece that is in the abstract show right now. Um, it started out as a tall coiled pot with the uh, coils added to it. And then I cut it from one side. And because of the, it was the clay was still very soft. Um, it just almost collapsed on itself. Like I knew that was gonna happen. So I gently let it collapse on itself. And then I manipulated it into the form and the shape that I wanted it to be. Uh, there's not a lot of carving in this one, but there is a lot of cutting and um, pushing things in and out to get the, the form. There's a couple different views from it. Um, at, the, at the art center right now, it is on the pedestal. Um, actually at home, I have it hanging on the wall and you can hang it in three different uh, ways. Uh, the way the, the wire is on the back, you can decide, you know, Pick your site, how you want to look at it. Um, see, here's another view. Because I think at home I have it hanging like this with that one site pointing up. Um, it's another one of my pieces. Uh, the other thing, um, so I don't just fire everything in the electric kiln. Electric kiln, you have a lot of control, right? Whatever you think the glaze will look like, most likely it will come out like that. I also do a lot of wood firing. And with wood firing, you basically uh, heat the kiln by throwing wood in it. And what happens with, when the wood burns, it creates a lot of ash and then the ash falls on the pots and that can get a, a specific effect. Uh, so when you wood fire, uh, it's not a guarantee what the final result or color will look like. It can look completely different each time. And also with wood firing, uh, it is hot. You need to wear protective gear, uh, protective, you know, you have to protect your hands, your face, um, your clothing as well. It needs to be made of cotton because you do not want to get burned and hot. Uh, you can see it in the pictures, the flames are shooting out. Um, this is a kiln in Dartmouth, Chris Custon's uh, Anagama kiln. I'm also currently, 
taking Seth, Seth Rainfield's class at the Falmouth Arts Center. It's a wood firing class. I highly recommend it if you like to play with fire and make some pots and then because um, you're actively participating in the firing. It's not just pressing a button on the on the electric kiln and the kiln does it for you. You have to manually feed that kiln until it reaches the temperature that you need it to reach. Um, so which can be a matter of one or two days or it could be 10 days and then it's around the clock that you feed it wood. And I, I mean, I enjoyed and I enjoyed the, uh, the results. So this is a piece out of the wood firing, which is currently also from the Art Center show at the Cape Cod Museum of Art. It got accepted there. Uh, so even if I would make something similar like this using the exact same glazes, it would not come out like that because you never know where the ash is going to fall, uh, the location in the kiln, you know, it might get cooler one time. It depends what is sitting next to it. If there's a, a someone else's work sitting next to it, that has a lot of iron in it, in the glazes, it will affect the color of my pieces. This is also in that same show at the Cape Cod Museum of Art, uh, same glaze. So you got similar, similar colors. Um, and then here's another one. Again, it's that exact same glaze, a different firing. And look at the result, it's completely different. So it's basically out of my control, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. I mean, you're hoping to, you know, you have expectations like, oh, it came out this time last time. Uh, so hopefully I get the, those same colors and it doesn't. And, but I like this one as well. It is a completely different feel to it. This one has a lot more warmer tones to it than the other ones. And again, same glaze. This one is almost white and tan. Uh, there's barely any color in it. Um, I also do Raku horsehair and Sager firings. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with it. Uh, Raku and horsehair, the, uh, the pieces come out of the kiln when they're hot. A Sager firing, you leave it in the kiln till it cools off. So I have a, a kiln in my backyard as well. Again, as I said, the pieces come out hot, which is almost 2000 degrees. So you, again, you need to wear your protective gear uh, so you don't get burned. And with the Raku, you take it out of the kiln hot and then it goes into, you see the trash cans there? They have a sawdust and newspaper. Since they're hot, they ignite themselves. So I put them in those trash cans um, full of combustibles and that gives the specific colors to the Raku pieces. Uh, oh, and here I am again, you know, with my full protective gear. Cause again, you don't want to get burned. I get burned sometimes, but Try not to talk about that. Um, with the Raku, I, I uh, <clears throat> make a lot of wall pieces because Raku is not functional. So in other words, you cannot eat or drink out of it. People, to, you know, when they see pottery, they want to use it. So I make wall pieces. Um, and who doesn't like fish? So I make some of these fish as well. So the colors you see in that, that's typical of Raku. It's, it's kind of coppery, but it's not all the same flat color. There's another Raku piece. Um, with horse hair, it's literally horse hair from the horse's tail that you put on the hot pot. So when hair burns, you know, it, it sizzles away. So in this case, the hair burns away completely, but the carbon in the hair leaves the markings on the pots. And then the sagar firing, um, you use, almost sounds like random stuff, but it really isn't. You use salt, sugar, banana peel, seaweed, copper wire, uh, coffee grounds. So there's no glaze on these pieces at all, but by adding all the other elements to it, <clears throat> and then you wrap it in aluminum foil, and then you burn it. Again, this has to be outside because it's going to smoke a lot. You get a lot of color on your pots. Well, hopefully you get a lot of color in your pots. And uh, But again, it's out of your control. In advance, you do not necessarily know what color you get. Um, it's always, so it's always a surprise when you, uh, when you open things up. Uh, and then I want to show you one more abstract piece. This is actually a paper clay. Uh, it's another wall hanging. Um, so it's all made with paper clay and then assembled on a board. Uh, and this one is really big. This is about probably what, four or five feet wide by three feet tall. And it weighs a ton. Um, so I think those were my images. So I'm going to stop sharing. And so I'm down in my studio basement. Uh, there's some pieces behind me. 
Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Well, we have our first question already, and I was thinking the same thing as this questioner. What is paper clay? So paper clay is when you add fiber to your clay, which could be paper, it could be fabric. So let's say paper. And it, the easiest way to do it, if you have a paper that is very easy to dissolve, like toilet paper. So um, you get your clay into a very watery, muddy form. And then you soak a roll of toilet paper in a bucket with water. And then you kind of squeeze the water out. So you have the paper pulp and you mix that with your muddy clay. You really, really mix it. So in other words, again, you're adding the fiber to the clay. Uh, and then you can build with it. It is, it is uh, slightly different to build with than it would be regular clay. Um, and then when it's being fired, so all those fibers will burn away meaning that your clay will be a lot lighter, right? It's not gonna be as heavy as if it's 100% clay. And the, there's a, a few funky things you can do with paper clay. Like when something is already dry and ready to go in the kiln, you can still attach things with paper clay as long as it's the same you know, clay and fiber that you're using together. So in a way it's magic. On the other hand, it's also trial and error. I've had a lot of frustrations with paper clay. Um, especially when you want to work big, it's uh, you should work in sections and not make one big piece. Uh, then I would recommend, you know, stick with real, you know, the, I guess, pure clay with a lot of um, additive as in grok and sand to it. So it's, it's stronger and you can build uh, bigger and taller, but again, it will be a lot heavier then. Does that somewhat answer the question of what paper clay is? I think it does. And we have another question uh, from, the, from a potter um, in the audience here about what cone level is the paper clay fired at? It depends on what clay is being used, right? So if I use a, uh, a low fire terracotta as my clay base, then that's as high as the temperature you can go, low fire. If I use a, a cone 10 porcelain as my clay base, so it doesn't matter the fibers that I add, that, that's not changing the temperature. It's the clay that you're using that decides the temperature you can go to. And I wanna ask about the, the owl behind you because uh, Corinna, she said, is taking a class here at the art center. It's so fun to have her here. And I went down into the clay studio a few weeks ago and saw this magnificent owl and said, who did that? and was told that Corinne did it. So tell us about the owl. Well, the owl, so I'm making that, or I made this with the, for the wood. So this one's gonna go in the upcoming wood firing. Um, and it, it's very simple. The reason I made the owl, cause I had a lot of chipmunks and birds eating my strawberries and my, <laughs> and my tomatoes. So I figure I need an owl for my garden. So why not put it in the wood firing? That is so great. I was not expecting that answer as to why you had it. Um, let's see, I see another question here for you. Do you primarily use your electric kiln uh, when not wood firing? Do you ever use a gas film kiln? I personally do not have a gas kiln. I guess my Raku kiln outside could be considered a gas kiln because I use propane to heat it. Not sure if I can reach uh, certain temperatures with it because again, it's not made to be a gas kiln. Um, so I, I every now and then I do fire in a gas kiln, but it's like I need to ask the people who have the gas kiln if I can fire some things in it. Um, so I have an electric kiln and raccoon kiln, and then again the wood firings you sign up. That's like a community thing because since that kiln needs to be fired, you know for so many hours or so many days. It, that is not something you can do by yourself. That's why it's always other people involved when there is a wood firing, because uh, that kiln needs to get going, right? You need to keep feeding it wood. And any other questions for Corinne? Other questions about Corinne's work? And I'll also, um, and Corinne, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. I know we all learned a lot during that. Um, and so I'll open it up for people to ask questions to Corinne, Mary, or Richard. 
other things people have thought of to ask uh, Mary or Richard or any other questions for Corinne? I'm gonna give it, give it a moment to uh, see if anyone is typing up a question here. Um, and for my part, I just wanna thank all three of you for participating uh, this afternoon into this evening. And it's, I just, I'm really loving these uh, virtual art receptions. We've learned so much about art in these receptions. I know people are really enjoying actually seeing the artist's spaces. Couple of questions came in here. Corinne, what size are your pieces in the slideshow? So she's uh, wondering those those pieces that we saw, What? how big uh, are those? Actually, I have a couple behind me, which are similar. Some are really tall, some are slightly smaller, right? So this also was wood fired, but the colors didn't came out well. So then it was refired in a gas kiln. The colors came out a lot better. This is another Sagar piece. Um, but I also have a lot smaller, like vase size, uh, just little little bowls or you know, mugs. I don't know, you know, a bunch of stuff. The ripples are really your signature, it seems like, Corinne. Yeah, well, but I also enjoy, I enjoy, I enjoy the carving. I enjoy the manipulation of it and the way the uh, the glazes affect, you know, the texture, the physical texture on it. A lot of questions coming in. Someone's asking about Bourne, the town of Bourne, asking if it's a community with artists how far away from Falmouth. And I can answer that it's right next door to Falmouth and really just uh, probably uh, the village of Pocasset where Corinne lives is probably um, a 15 minute drive from the Falmouth Art Center. So not that far away, but yes. uh, Corinne, I don't know if you wanna add anything about uh, Bourne and the, the artists of Bourne. Uh, there's actually pretty close by where I am. Uh, and this is, uh, Kim and Hollis have their studio. Um, and then there's a glass artist right down the road from there as well. So we have artists all over Cape Cod. All over, really. yes. You can always find artists on the Cape. Yeah. Another question. Do you start with a sketch or just a concept, for example, for your pots with motion? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes I do start with sketches. Hold on, where are they? They're on the wall behind me. And that might be... That might be the idea of the form. I don't know if you can see it, it's hard to see maybe. We can see it. Right, play around with the form, how I think it will affect the uh, the movement to it or does it take away from the movement? Uh, some, I wish I had more time to really play with the form. Um, you know, cause again, I, I teach every day at the high school. So I'm limited to then in my, in my free time um so and and so for example the piece that is in the show right now um i did not know what the final form would be when i was working on it but i did know so it started out as a big tall piece and i, as I said i cut one side so it couldn't hold the shape anymore like the cylinder form so i had to put it on its side and manipulate it and cut other sides away so I, I had an idea of what I wanted it to be. Uh, I'm sure it came out different than my initial intention was. Um, but again, it's clay. As, as long as it's soft, you can keep manipulating it and moving it around and, and supporting it in certain areas until you end up with a final uh, form that you do enjoy. There's another question. Are the large pieces that you just showed thrown or hand-built? Uh, often I start with a th with a throne, let's say a large bowl or as large as I can make it. As I because as I mentioned before, I really don't have the arm muscle strength to to throw like a twenty pound bowl. I, I just can't do it. Um, so maybe six pounds at the most that I can throw, and then I continue to coil it to gain the height or the width or whatever form I want to start out with. Very good and. 
Any other questions for Corinne or Mary or Richard? I think we're nearing the end here. And uh, someone gives this comment, which I definitely agree with wonderful presentations and such creative, generous minds. So that is certainly a good comment to end with. So I really thank Richard and Mary and Corinne for being with us here today. And thank you all for coming. And I wanna do a special shout out to Melissa Morris who brought her whole art class to this session. So we appreciate that, <laughs> Melissa. And uh, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you again next month at our next uh, virtual art reception. Thank you all. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Tony Gribben. How do you leave here? Huh? <laughs>